It's not hey, on the page. everybody. Welcome to Hump Day Hangouts. This is the pre-Halloween uh, Hump Day Hangouts. Also, this is the week before uh, it is uh, our six-year anniversary. So pretty awesome. Uh, it's been going strong. I think Bradley, uh, I don't think, I know Bradley has by far the most uh, appearances here on Hump Day Hangouts. I think he's only taken a couple Christmases off and maybe uh, one or two others, but Anyways, really happy about that. Uh, if we may be having some special stuff for this six-year anniversary, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if you're watching, whether you're watching live uh, at hump, uh, sorry, at semanticmastery.com/hdquestions, or if you're checking it out on YouTube and watching the replay, uh, jump on to the email list. Um, not only do we send specials, do we send news and updates, uh, but also if there is going to be something special. With the uh, six-year anniversary, it's going to be uh, to our email subscribers. So you can go to semanticmastery.com, or if you're, again, watching live, you can just scroll down to the bottom of the page, pop in your name there, and you will be good to go. So uh, well, we've got a couple of us here today. Uh, we're going to say hello and uh, do a quick chat and check-in, and then we're going to get into the questions. Uh, I was just scrolling around on the page. It looks like we got several. So... Uh, I'll start at the top of my screen here. We got uh, Mr. Chris. How are you doing today? Doing good. It's interestingly warm here um, at the moment. So not sure what's up with the weather, but like things are all good. Had a nice sunny day. Was at uh, uh, Danube Breaver and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a bit of a relaxing. Well, we still can do it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, Hernan, how about yourself? How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm still in Miami, flying back on Friday, back to Buenos Aires. So, looking forward for some uh, for some spring down there. Everything is <laughs> everything is good. Everything is good. Cool. And uh, Bradley, is all the tech stuff taken care of? It's done for now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, other than that, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? I'm uh, happy to be here. I've got a ton of stuff going on. Like I'm overwhelmed with work right now, which is a good thing. But I don't know if you guys are the same way. But whenever I'm like you know, neck deep in work, uh, the days fly by like out, like a blink of an eye and the whole work day is gone. And I'm like, shit, it's evening. What the hell happened? You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, it's crazy because it's like time just flies when you're busy. You know what I mean? So it's just been really crazy the last couple of weeks. Well, yeah, that reminds me, I, I know I brought it up and I'm not at all, uh, Sam Bradley, this is where you're at. Cause I know you're like you said, real deep in a bunch of projects. Um, but I've been going back over some stuff and doing some more reading kind of about that, like cutting out more. Um, and getting more efficient and looking back over, hey, what am I really spending my time doing? I've been real busy the last three or four months. And I think my like personal, I do 90 day goals. I think you, most of you guys do too. And I know one of mine for this next 90 days is going to be clearing out about 20 or 25% of my time and just saying, you know, hey, I want to have time uh, both just to myself, but also I find that I'm at the best and I I'm able to come up with the best ideas and put the best results out when I have some breathing room. I mean, everything's cyclical, right? We work on projects, we get busy, but if I stay up there too long, the results just drop because yeah. then I just turn into zombie. I'm doing stuff. And then I don't have that time to kind of integrate and think things over and synthesize. Yep. Yeah. That's part of the reason I go on frequent uh, weekend riding trips and, and camp for a weekend and, you know, and try to go at least once a quarter now for several days throughout the week too. like take off a few days for the, during the week and just unplug. And when I go to the mountains to go ATV riding, I literally put my phone in the truck and I don't touch it for days. <laughs> like, and that's like truly unplugging, which is hard to do. But once, once I, you know, I always come back refreshed and renewed and, and able to work with more concentration, less distraction, everything else, uh, more productive essentially. So I think yeah. that's important to do that, to take time away and, and recharge Definitely. Well, this is a little bit of mindset intro, but something else I'm sure a lot of other people have had. This isn't some secret and by any means, uh, but kind of planning out what your um, ideal day is. And just uh, this is one I have fun with every once in a while and just kind of stretching and saying, you know, a couple of years ago, I think I said like, oh, I'd like to, you know, work in the mornings, uh, like go for a run and then take the afternoons off. And for me, that was a real stretch. And now it's like, OK, well, I wait, I've actually been doing that a lot now what like what do i want to do and it's really fun to like sit down and actually write it out and like if i had my perfect day in the sense that i could live it every day what would that look like now have you guys ever done anything like that occasionally it's yeah. hard to define yeah. that 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the fun, right? You'll find the the answer is in asking yourself the question, right? Because you'll never hit that ideal, but it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I can ask myself, what is it that I want to do and actually think that through? So I don't, Hernan, you're shaking your head. Have you done this a few times? Yeah, I've done a few times the uh, ideal ideal day type of type of approach. And yeah, like it's it's funny because it's been getting closer or not yet, but it's been getting closer. It's pretty similar to what you're saying. It's like do a lot of high level strategy work in the morning, you know, managing the team and then taking the afternoons to do some lighter type of work, you know. So ideally yeah. working the four hour work week, you know, doesn't work with me, but the four hour or six hour work day would be pretty cool. So anyways, yeah, that's that's where I'm heading. But yeah, it's an exercise that you need to do pretty much with with everything, right? What does your ideal work day looks like? What does your ideal uh, weekend looks like? What does your ideal uh, work week or, or month looks like? All of that. So it's crazy once you stop putting it together, how closer you get to it without even noticing. So, yeah. Yeah. And I find this stuff to be cyclical too, where I've got to come back to it every once in a while because things will kind of get away from me and then, you know, say, hey, am I really doing what I want to do? quick check in and, you know, make some changes. So uh, how about you, Chris, do you have a different way of doing this or is it something similar? Yeah. Like I've done the perfect exercise multiple times and uh, also like in the U uh, S and stuff, how we do it, the 10, three, one. So you map out 10 years, what the ideal case would be, then go backwards to three years then one years. And then you break it down to like 90 days, one days, et cetera, like exact, pretty much the same as like best soft journal or um, US system like we do for our company as well. Outstanding. I was just flipping through uh, while you're finishing up there, Chris. I see Marco is with us in uh, not in person today, uh, but he is on the page. Marco has been posting some pictures and stuff. So Mar he's taking some uh, well-deserved time. What's that? He's in our heart. <laughs> and then gifts on the page. So um, awesome. Well, we got just a few quick announcements and then we'll get into it. Um, you know, if you're new to Semantic Mastery, first of all, thanks for watching, whether you're, again, you're watching live or checking the replay, um, you know, uh, the best place for you to start, which is something we get asked a lot, uh, is, you know, there's a couple different places, which we're going to consolidate down over time. Uh, but one of the best things you can do right now is to find out how to shield your site and never worry about algorithm updates again with the free SEO shield training. So you can find that at theseoshield.com. And if you're an agency owner or a consultant, right, then if so, I think all of us fall into some category in there. And if you would like to get more clients, if you want to grow your revenue, do you want to scale a team? Uh, so you can consider these questions like we were just talking about, about how you can work less, be more effective, earn more, uh, then go check out 2xyouragency.com. That's literally the number two, then an X, youragency.com. Uh, and then following on from the SEO shield, if you're looking for something a little bit beyond that, you can check out the battle plan, all right? Step-by-step -step processes for getting step, uh, sorry, step-by-step -step processes for getting SEO results. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, we're really happy to welcome several new members into our mastermind last week. Uh, but if you're ready to grow your digital marketing business, then this is the community you want to be a part of. Um, you know, it's faster access not only to ourselves, but to the community of uh, individuals who are growing their consulting, who are growing their businesses, who are growing their digital agencies. And getting that, uh, that community and network, uh, I can tell you personally, is invaluable. Um, so find out more about that at mastermind.semanticmastery. Dot com. And also, uh, we've mentioned it before, but head over to mgyb.co uh, if you want your done for you services, whether it's syndication networks, whether it's an SEO shield, um, whether it's link building, any of that sort of good stuff. And we've got uh, more on the way. But, you know, we always say it, uh, you know, if you're not going to be building the stuff yourself, uh, you know, as a business, then you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. You know, get it built white label it, you can sell it to clients, you can use it for your own projects, but your time is generally better spent elsewhere. So head over to mgyb.co. All right, with that said, guys, is there any other uh, announcements before we hop into it? Two things, remember to uh, re drop the links for the POFU live recordings in case anybody wants to check those out. And also, I wanna also remind people that the uh, Lead Simplify offer is still available. And, um, it's a fantastic application, very inexpensive guys. I mean, it's, it's silly inexpensive to be honest with you, like $39.99 per month, right? $39 and 99 cents per month. And it's a fantastic app for any of you that are doing lead gen work. I highly recommend that you get it. 
Um, also, if you're doing a lot of client work with like contractors, especially, uh, then it's also really good for just managing leads for contractors and j jobs and things like that. So just go check out the replay, uh, take a look at it and see if it's something that would, you know, be a value for your business. I can tell you for me, it's, it's, it's actually really improved my lead gen business, which I've been running since essentially 2010. Uh, so for 10 years, I've had systems in place that have been working, but then I saw the lead simplify model and the webinar that Mike Martin uh, did. And, and I saw, saw a lot of value there. So I purchased it for my own business. And then after I integrated it into my business and realized how much it improved my lead generation business, that's when I asked Mike to come do a webinar for our audience. So again, it's something I think is incredibly valuable. And for the price, it's just a no brainer. It's stupid, inexpensive. <laughs> so, so go check it out if you haven't already and pick it up. Um, I, I think it's totally worth it for sure. Awesome. Just put that on the page too. If anyone's interested, we got the replay available. You can just head over, check it out after hump day hangouts. Very cool. Anything else guys, before I grab the screen? All right, let's do it. I'm going to try to answer all these questions today without Marco, but some SEO questions are uh, like above my head at this point. <laughs> so, so if I can't answer them, guys, then I apologize. We'll uh, we'll get to them again next week if needed. All right, everybody, you can see my screen, correct? Okay. Yeah, yes. we're good. Good to go. All right. So, first question is for this service, GMB verification, MGYB.co. Okay. Does this mean I could buy a GMB listing for say a made up construction company in any city I want? Yes. That's what that means. They're slow to be delivered right now. GMB is back on a rampage again. Uh, you know, it goes in cycles and for a, a long period of time last year, we couldn't really do anything with GMBs because they just like, if you touched a GMB, it would get suspended. Then it kind of eased back or Google rolled back on that, you know, that itchy trigger finger, so to speak, right? They, they kind of rolled that back a bit and you were able to go in and we were able to get new GMB listings set up uh, without a lot of issue. Uh, all, you were able to make edits to existing listings without any issue. At least I didn't experience any for, and I've got dozens and dozens of them. Uh, but all of a sudden within the just last few weeks, again, they're, they're back to being really, really um, sensitive in that if you make any changes to them, they will likely get suspended. So just keep that in mind. Yes, you can. As far as I know, you can order them right now. I, I don't want to eat my words. I'd have to go on the page to see if it says sold out when you go to purchase. It means that we can't we can't deliver those right now. And it might be because, uh, again, Google's on a rampage again. So, you know, if it's available, then, yeah, go ahead and purchase it. It might be a few weeks or even, you know, a couple of months before it gets delivered. It's just the nature of GMBs right now, guys. Uh, but yes, that is essentially the case. If, if, if you can, you know, you can submit an order and if we can fulfill it, we will. And uh, that means that you'll have a GMB in the location for whatever company name you, you want. Um, and then, yeah, you can, you can use that for lead gen or for client stuff, that kind of thing. Okay. Do we know if that's available right now, guys? Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Uh, would there be a way to get reviews to that GMB? Not really. I mean, you can buy spam reviews from people, but you got to be real careful about that. You also have to be aware of your law, the laws in your state or the state where you have the GMB set up because fake reviews can be illegal. So you have to be very, very careful. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. That's not my job. That's your job to determine whether you can buy uh, reviews or not. Um, there are some uh, software programs out there that will also do that. Uh, you know, again, I, I just caution everybody to become aware of the laws in your state and also think about, you know, think about long term and all that other kind of stuff. You know, I, I, I used to seed some of my lead gen assets with uh, reviews just to get them started. Then once I started, you know, getting calls and sending leads to the service provider or the lead buyer that was buying leads from me. Then we would solicit reviews underneath the lead gen brand, uh, you know, so that we start getting real reviews. But honestly, even with new, new GMB stuff or new lead gen assets that I set up, I don't like doing any sort of fake review stuff now, guys. It's just it's become really a, a, a kind of a tricky area, and I, I just don't like to take any chances. 
So again, yes, you can do that, but I would caution you to be very, very careful about it. All right. Uh, let's see. Can I, can I still rank in the local pack? Wait a minute. There's 18 questions in this, guys. We, we say this all the time, but this might be the first time you've heard it. So I'm going to say it again. Guys, try to be more, uh, you know, try, try to be more, uh, you know, better about posting questions so that we don't have like 18 questions posted into one post because then it ends up taking up way too much time and it's not fair to others. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Post one or two questions and then allow other people to post questions and then you can post additional questions. All right, I just need to make sure that that's clear because some of you guys come here and post multiple questions at once every single week. And we have to remind people of that every week. And sometimes you guys just ignore that. So I'll continue on. Would I need a physical address for that? Just city and state. Uh, no, you don't need an address if you order from us because they'll, you know, they, they basically spam an address. You just say which city and state you want. You add the phone number. A web address if you have one already set up or that you're going to use for that location and you provide the company name and also the service area if it's a service area business that's it the address will be you know created at the time that they create the listing all right in that case could i still rank it in the local pack without an actual address location well it has an address when it gets set up okay if it's a service area business then you're supposed to you need an address in order to create a listing, right? And so if you if you order a GMB verification service from us or elsewhere, they're going to create an address. It has to. There has to be a physical location, okay? If it's a service area business, as per Google's terms of service, then once the listing has been verified, you're supposed to clear the address so that it no longer shows or is published in Google Maps, the, the, the street address. The city state zip will still be published, but the street address will not. And again, this, that's as per Google's terms of service. Also, I never recommend using a spammed GMB listing if it's a point of sale or storefront business. What that means is if customers come to the business location, that's considered a storefront business or what a point of sale business. One of, you can call it either one. But that would be dumb in my opinion. I've never understood anybody creating a spam GMB listing for a point of sale or storefront business because that would be very misleading to customers looking for that sort of business and then you know clicking and seeing the address and then perhaps going to the business without calling ahead and realizing that there's no actual business there. So I've never done that. And I've always thought that was really stupid. In my opinion, uh, only time you should ever use like spam GMB listings is if it's a service area business where the business serves the customer at the customer's location, okay? So again, you don't need a physical location uh, except for to, to verify it originally. And then if it's a service area business, which is the only way that I will set up a lead gen or a spam listing is if it's for service area businesses. And in that case, as per Google's terms of service, you need to clear the street address so that it's no longer published um, and just set your service area instead, okay? Okay. That would be crazy if I could rank that and just get a phone number action into those searches. Wow. How high is the risk to lose the GMB properties from Google shutting them down? Well, in my experience, they, they tend to stick as long as you don't go in and edit them. The only time I've had, well, and I'm not going to say the only time I think out of the dozens and dozens and dozens of GMBs lead gens that I'd set up over the years. Uh, I've only had a, like literally two of them set uh, suspended that wasn't from making an edit. Like in other words, I've had two of them suspended where just one day I, I went to go look at the account, it was gone, or it says it's suspended for you know suspicious activities or whatever, whatever the warning is. But I've had many that were suspended when I've gone in to make some sort of edit to the info tab, right? So that means changing the service area or changing the phone number or changing the web address or, and sometimes it's dumb shit, like even swap, like changing a photo, like, you know, seriously, like deleting one photo and uploading a new one. And that's caused a suspension. So, like I said, if you don't have, if you can't help it, try not to edit the uh, listing, which is difficult because especially if you buy a listing, typically it's only going to be the very bare minimum uh, details added, like the phone number, uh, web address, if you have that ahead of time, 
service area, and that's it, like the business name and hours of operation, if you can specify that too. But other than that, like you won't have the business description filled out, you won't have the GMB website set up. And so I, you know, again, it's very difficult right now, I, I would highly recommend just keeping away from GMB or making any sort of edits to it. If you can set it up, that's fine. But don't make any edits to it, because it will likely get suspended. I just had one happen last week is my point. From our own service that I ordered from, it was delivered. And uh, I went in and went to go make an edit to just clear the street address because it was a service area business and add my service areas. And as soon as I cleared the street address and clicked save, it automatically suspended it. So again, that's why I say, I, I'm just not even going to touch anything right now until I know that they're clear. Uh, and that's what I would recommend you do as well. This is also have some connections to the towing and auto repair industries. And I'm open to other niches of some GMB niches are safer than others. Yeah, I think towing is rather spammed. Uh, so it's probably even more sensitive. I don't know that to be the case because I'm not in towing niche. Maybe somebody else is, but I'm pretty sure that that's a fairly, um, you know, monitored, a highly monitored niche because it's been known to be spammy. So, but that's, that's just, uh, I'm not hundred percent sure because I'm not in the towing industry. Okay. He says long-term so I can safely invest in ranking them and setting up lead buyers. Let me know. Yeah. I mean, again, I've got tons of them, but I try not to edit them if, if possible. Um, so I also found it better to still verify guys from, let's see if I can find this real quick. Just give me one second. Yeah, it's right here. Okay. Never mind. It used to be right there. There's a street address option that you can use PO boxes at your, your local post office or wherever you want to set the lead gen business up. Obviously it's easier if it's somewhat local to you because you can go do it. You can reserve, you can go to the USPS.com, which is United States Postal Service, right? So go to USPS.com. You can reserve a PO box online. You can pay for it, everything. But then you have to go to that post office box, uh, the post office that you reserve the box at and fill out the paperwork. Um, actually, you can fill the paperwork out at home, but you have to bring it to the post office with your photo ID and something else like a... Um, car registration or some a vehicle registration card or something like that that show you know it's a it's another like a uh so it's another form of id essentially but you have to have two forms of id and then you you know fill out you sign the the paperwork in front of them or whatever and you submit it and then they'll issue the po box at which point you can use the street address of the post office box and then you get a box number so whatever your po let's say your po box number is 101 then you can use, you know, the street address. Let's say it's one, two, three main street, number 101, right? And so you can do that and still verify listings on your own. And those tend to stick a lot longer than um, some of the other methods that I've seen, because I've got a lot of those. So that's, that still works. And it doesn't cost anything extra to use the street address option. It's just one additional form that you fill out. Uh, you used to have a link for a PDF that you could download for that, that additional form. Um, but not all post offices even know that they that you can do that. So sometimes you have to try to educate the idiot behind the counter at the post office because they don't know about it. And um, and I've had many arguments with post office people about the ability, you know, whether or not I can do that. Some post offices say, no, you, we, we don't we don't offer that bullshit. It's United States Postal Service, which means it's a federal agency, which means if it works at one, it should work at all of them across the entire United States. Um, so just keep that in mind. Sometimes they're ignorant and they just don't know. All right. That was a lot. And then there's a follow-up to that from the same, <laughs> from the same person, Bradley Benner having GMBs in this way seems to tie in the clients versus lead selling and some things you are doing with selling leads and putting the lead simplify forms on the GMB site. Please share what you can. Okay. No, you can't put the lead simplify form on the GMB site. You can put it on Google sites, but not the Google GMB website. The GMB website is very limited in what you can do. However, you can do outbound links from the GMB website. So you could put a bold call to action on the GMB website in text with a hyperlink uh, that hyperlinks to a Google or excuse me, a uh, lead simplify form, right? You can absolutely do that. But as I've said before, you, I, prefer to set up GMB assets and, and also always put the SEO shield around everything that I do. And that comes with a Google site, right? A G site. And so with the Google site, you don't need a self-hosted website. I still prefer to use self-hosted websites, but you don't need one. You can use the Google site from an SEO shield 
as your primary website for that location, in which case you can absolutely embed a lead simplify form. But you can, like I said, from the GMB website, because all you can add is text and links to the GMB website. That's it. No forms, no pages. You can add GMB posts, but you can't add pages. So on that, you could put a call to action. You could bold it. Can't really make it any bigger or anything else, but you can bold it and then put a hyperlink over to a lead simplify form. But again, I would recommend that you use a Google site included or as part of that um, lead gen asset make that the primary website for that location. And then you can embed a GM or excuse me, a lead simplify form directly into the new Google site. Okay. All right, moving on. Next is Micah. Micah says, Hey guys, looking to get myself a subscription to an indexing service. Is it safe to run URLs already indexed through an indexer? Yes. It won't hurt anything. I have spreadsheets created months ago with links I manually built to a money site and I pinged all the URLs back then. Some index naturally, but the others haven't. Would it be safe to run all those links through the indexer or could I risk de-indexing them completely? No, 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 that won't, it won't cause any problems. I've not experienced that ever. Um, it won't hurt anything. If something's already indexed and you send it through an indexer, it doesn't, it just gets it to get, it, it gets the, that link recrawled a grant again, but it's, uh, it shouldn't, shouldn't have any problem on that. These are quality links to the money site, not tiered web twos. Yeah, so I would just run it through there. Um, the one that <clears throat> I'm using currently, you know, we have a uh, indexing service in MGYB that is really, really good, but there's some limitations, unfortunately, where you can only submit 300 URLs at a time. So if you've got thousands and thousands of links, like from spam tools, um, then you're, you're not going to be able to, let's see, I need to, what I need to do actually is back out of that for a minute. If you've got a bunch of links from using like link building, you know, kind of spam tools, then that's not going to be feasible for you to use the indexing service in MGYB because you have, you can only submit 300 at a time, you know, and if you've got 7,000 links that you're adding, uh, you know, I, I would never recommend for somebody to sit there for hours and submit 300 links at a time until all 7,000 were submitted. It's just ridiculous. So don't do it. But there is a really high indexing rate through mgyb.co because what our link builder, Dedia, does is he puts whatever you submit through our indexing service at mgyb.co, he puts through several indexers. So they go through multiple indexing services to get indexed. That's why it works so well. But again, there's a limitation to that. So even for my own projects, what I'm using, because I don't, um, I don't have the ability either inside of MGYB to submit more than 300 as I'm using index inject. I think it's.com. Yes. Index inject.com. This is what I'm using. Uh, and again, this was based upon the recommendation from Dedia, our link builder. I asked him if, if there was one indexing service that you could recommend to index a lot of links, what would it be? And he said this one, there's another one called uh, Omega Indexer, but it is super expensive. So I would not recommend that one. So for this one, Index Inject, that's what I'm using uh, for my own links. Uh, you know, when I get link building campaigns back from MGYB, I go and take the tier one links only and, and um, submit them to Index Inject for indexing. Because uh, again, if you start submitting tier two links as well, then you're going to burn through your indexing credits very, very quickly. Okay. All right, moving on. Fitz, what's up, Fitz? He says, good day, gents. Marco, can you please drop the link to your charity? Unfortunately, Marco's not here. If somebody else has the link and they want to drop it, uh, feel free. The need of those- I have, it. I have it somewhere. I'll drop okay. it in there. Cool, thank you. Or none. The need of these wonderful kids are ongoing, and I hope a few generous people will contribute a little because it will mean a lot to these great kids. Yeah, especially around starting to be the holiday season, so- my question this week is when you get an RYS expansion delivered, do you want a press release stack to that new site and not the first one that came with the original RYS shield? Thank you. Okay. Well, I think you are, you might be confusing uh, or conflating two different terms fits. And the only reason I say that is because <clears throat> let's go to the store real quick and I'll show you what I mean. Stand by. Okay. So if you do the RYS expansion, then what this is doing is you get, it's building, it's adding to an existing G site and an existing folder, right? Drive folder that was set up for your original, you know, entity or brand 
for that project. So a Google Drive expansion stack, stack and Google site setup is, is essentially it's, it's building onto an existing stack and an existing G site. It's not an additional G site or an additional stack, right? If you wanted that, then you would, let me back up for a minute. That wouldn't be an expansion. That would be a um, location shield. So if you go down to the SEO shield down here and you look at learn more, uh, look at the different options there, you'll see that there are three different shield types, the SEO starter shield, the SEO location shield, and the SEO power shield. The location shield would be if you wanted to add separate G sites for say additional locations. Let's say it's a multi-location business. Say it's a, you know, a, I don't know, a, a coffee shop and they've got three different locations. Then you would want, if you wanted to have like a different G site, a different ID page uh, and a different, um, you know, essentially drive stack for each location, then that's what you would do with the location shield. But if for an RYS expansion, it's going to build inside of an existing drive stack and an existing G site. Personally, that's how I prefer to do it all. I do everything using the RYS expansion stack instead um, of the uh, location shields, because again, I will end up getting, uh, and what I do is I just either order another ID page or clone an existing ID page and then just swap out the details and then upload it to S3. And I've got a unique ID page for each additional location. Even for multi-location businesses, I use the Google expansion stack uh, because what I do is I set up the SEO power shield for the, for the brand initially. And then I go and order an, R, an RYS expansion stack for each location that's underneath that brand, right? And so essentially I'll have a new um, page on the G site as well as a new folder inside the original drive stack folder that will be optimized for that specific location, right? So you can put the NAP details in there, but it's all under the same G site. My point is this guys, if, if you start with even a, um, location shield, right, which creates a new drive stack, a new G site, then you have to basically, you have to start powering all those up from scratch. Whereas if you start with, a, if you have a, an existing SEO power shield that you have built for a, a particular project and entity, it's branded. Now, if you're, you know, you're, you're likely already powering that up with additional links and everything else that you're doing to it, press releases, all that other stuff, so if you build into that, right, so like a subfolder inside the main drive stack folder and a page on the G site, then it's going to benefit instantly from the authority that you've been building to the original stack anyways and G site, right? Does that make sense? So I prefer to use expansion stacks for everything. Um, and that's just my preference because I, again, you benefit from the instant authority that it will uh, receive from the work that you've previously been doing to the original main entity stack. Okay. Do you run press releases stack to that new and not the first one that came? No, no. And again, so that's, that's my whole point is I'm always building the, the original stack and G site up, right? Constantly powering that up. And so every time I add a new uh, expansion to it, right? And guys, remember, you can do an, exp the way that we teach this, and again, go to the, the T H E S E O shield.com and you can get training on all of this for free. Okay. But the idea with the SEO power shield is to set it up for whatever your primary keyword is. And some businesses say, well, I've got, you know, three main services. We'll pick one, pick one and make that your primary keyword. And what we do with the SEO power shield is we optimize it or set it up for one keyword plus brand. Right. And if it's local, it could be keyword plus location plus brand. Right. And so we optimize that and that becomes, becomes the primary branded stack. That's what we start with. But then let's say that you've got, you know, for, for me, let's say for tree services stuff, it's going to be set up for tree service plus city, then whatever the brand name is for that particular project. Then what I'll do is let's say I've got two topical categories or silos on the site. Let's say one is for tree removal and one is for tree trimming. Well, then I'm going to order an RYS expansion stack for one optimized for one for tree trimming and one for tree removal, right? So essentially I'm going to have RYS expansions built out for each one of my primary service categories on the site. Then I'm going to go out. If I've got multiple locations, I'm going to, let's say I've got three locations for that project. Then I'm going to also order an RYS expansion for each individual location. Does that make sense? So then, you know, let's say, you know, Culpepper, 
uh, Warrington, Fredericksburg. I would have a separate RYS expansion for each one of those three cities that would have the NAP of each location. So then I, now I've got my original branded S power, SEO power shield, original, you know, in the G site and everything. And then I'm going to have a page for each of the topical categories, service categories, essentially, right? One for tree trimming, one for tree removal. Then I'm going to have a separate page uh, or RYS expansion for each one of the locations. And if there was three locations, there'd be three of those as well. And now you just power the shit up. You power that by just hammering the shit out of it. Um, and every single one of those, right? Each one of those drive stack folders, the files contained within each folder, the G site page, all of that mirrored on your uh, money site. If you have that, that's the whole point, right? So you benefit from anything that you add to the original stack in the drive uh, G site by just making it like an internal page and a subfolder within the main drive stack folder. All right, hopefully that cleared some things up. Ed is up next. He says, any update on IFTTT syndication networks? Thanks to the, uh, have we ever made a, Adam, maybe you would know. And if not, maybe we need to make a note of this to get April to set up a, an FAQ for this. The IFTTT changes, because we get this question almost every week and we've been answering it for months. Yeah, I mean, we could just, if you want to answer it, or if you can point me to the right one, we could just create a URL for like IFTTT update or something. Okay, and that's no problem. I'll answer it again. It's just, uh, I think going forward, it'd be easier just to do an at reply, go here, because we've answered this, you know, yeah, almost every week for several, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks now. So anyway, sorry, Ed, I'm not picking on you. It's just this question comes up almost every single week. Any update on IFTTT syndication networks thanks to the functionality limits? If I ordered another shield, is this process set up still good? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. What I'm not sure what that has to do with IFTTT. Is there an alternative to IFTTT? What's the good words, gents? Thank you. Okay, guys, I've talked about this a lot. I'll talk about it again. Guys, it, you can create, you can only create three applets in IFTTT on a free account but you can enable as many applets as you want. You just got to go to the explore tab. So log into IFTTT, the top right corner, look at the, for the explore button, click that, and then just go search for the applets as they were titled, right? So like RSS to uh, WordPress, RSS to Blogger, RSS to Tumblr, RSS to Digo, you know, look for those applets. They're there in the library in IFTTT. Stephen R. Reynolds, look at where it says buy and it says who they were. You'll see Big Bamboo Mobile in there, which is applets that I've created. Stephen R. Reynolds, they're applets I created. Vernon E. Dunn, like from the first two versions, Syndication Academy version one and version two, I set up all those applets or they used to be called recipes, but now they're called applets. And I use Stephen R. Reynolds as the persona for the first version of Syndication Academy. For the second one, it was Vernon E. Dunn. So you can find those applets that were already created in IFTTT and you can enable them. And they're, they're set up with the same specifications that we had always set them up for because I created them. <laughs> so uh, yes, you can just go to the explore tab, search for them. If it's for YouTube, look for YouTube to blogger, YouTube to Tumblr, or search for YT to Tumblr, which is the, you know, just short version for YouTube. And you'll find them in there. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass that you got to go look for the, um, applets. I understand that, but it is what it is or else you could pay for a pro account and go create up your own, create your own. And I think pro accounts are like two ninety nine dollars a month or something like that. So it's very, very inexpensive, but certainly I understand if you've got, you know, 15 syndication networks, you don't, you, you might not want to spend $2 a month on every syndication network that makes, you know, uh, that, and that I, I completely understand that. So if for the inconvenience of just a few minutes to go in and go to the explore tab, locate the applet that you want and turn it on and then add your RSS feed or connect it, you know, to your YouTube channel or whatever, uh, then that's, that's how you get around that. Okay. We actually set up a pro account for us so that we could publish applets um, or create applets, but so far it's still not letting us publish them. I was told by, I had a phone call or a Zoom call with a, uh, an IFTTT rep specifically about this so that we could publish applets again and be able to share them with you guys. Um, unfortunately, the, the, he said that it was gonna be available under the pro account to be able to do that. It's, it's yet, I, I spent a, a couple hours in there about two weeks ago and it's still not available yet. Um, so if it's not available in a few more weeks, I'll probably just you know 
uh, follow back up with them, a, a rapid IFTTT again to find out. But um, in the meantime, like I said, it's just a slight inconvenience or, to go find the applets, enable them, add your, your uh, you know, whatever the trigger mechanism is, whether it's RSS or YouTube or whatever. Um, and then, and that's it. Just that, that's all it takes. Okay. It's a little bit of an inconvenience. Like I said, otherwise you can pay for three, you know, three bucks a month or whatever it is. All right. Moving on. <laughs> That's funny. I saw the gift. Scott's up. What's up, Scott? He says, Google search console is not allowing us to request individual page indexing. This will supposedly last several weeks while Google updates infrastructure. Is there any new strategy for indexation for individual pages? I will use the mgyb.co for multiple pages. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So that there's a few things that you can do. I'm going to talk about all of them right now. Um, that's a good question. This came up in our mastermind uh, recently too. And, um, and I, I did some research. There's a few tricks Number one, let's go back to MGYB. Uh, guys, because it's very inexpensive, I was just talking about the indexing service. It, it works really, really well. So if you come down here and look at backlink indexing right there, okay? It's very inexpensive. You can buy credits. So 2,500 credits, indexing credits is 10 bucks, right? 50,000 indexing credits is 80 bucks. If you're trying to like index money site pages, you can use this service because it works really, really well to just go in there and paste, you know, you can do one at a time, it's fine. You buy credits and then the credits are available. And when you log into the dashboard of uh, MGYB, you go to uh, link indexing and it tells you right in the dashboard how many credits you have available. And then you can just paste in your URLs and do that. That's one way to do it, okay? Another way to do it would be to uh, resubmit your site map to Google Search Console. Um, you can also do a GMB post if, it, if you if you have if it's for a local, you can do a GMB post and use the CTA button, the call to action button in a GMB post, like the learn more button, for example, um, and link to the page that you want to index, then publish the GMB post. That will tend to get it to index rather quickly too. Also, you can if you have a Twitter account that um, has real followers, you know, real activity, you can always tweet the URL. That will oftentimes get it indexed uh, rather quickly or do a Twitter moment, create a Twitter moment with the URL. Uh, that will also get it to index. Not only that, but Twitter moments are pretty powerful. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty powerful. So you can also create a Twitter moment with the link to the page that you want to index, then take the tweet, the Twitter moment URL, and you can use that to hammer that with backlinks because Twitter will clean that link or you know, link laundering is what we call it, right? It will launder that link. Uh, but it will help push through Twitter, push authority through Twitter into that particular page. Okay, so that's another thing you can do. And lastly, this, I'm going to put this on the page. This is a WordPress plugin uh, by Rank Math. They have a full SEO plugin, but that you can, you can install just this, which is called the in Instant Indexing API plugin that connects to Google. You have to go to uh, Google Developers, so developers.google.com. You have to make sure that you have Billing details, uh, like a billing, like a credit card enabled uh, for the developer console, you have to have billing enabled and, a, you know, uh, uh, a credit card added to the account or billing source added to the account. It can be a, um, a it can be a, a direct bank debit, like so it can debit from your bank account or you can add a credit card, but you have to have a billing, billing set up inside of it. Um, and then you can connect the, and there's help files in here to tell you how to do it but you then connect directly to the Google a uh, indexing API. There's a, there's, a, there's a warning that even the plugin developers mentioned that G Google states that you're only supposed to be directly submitting uh, links to the indexing API if it's for live stream sites or something else, I think news sites or something like that. But they tell you, you know, they even in the help files, they say, you know, so use it your own risk, but I've got this on several sites right now, guys, I'm not kidding because of the very reason that Scott just brought up that the um, URL inspection and in request indexing in search console, when you go to request indexing, it's kind of grayed out and it says it's been disabled for likely weeks while some upgrades are being done. And who knows, they might not ever re-enable that again. So instead go directly to their API and, in, and, it's, and it's instant. Like what's cool about this is when you set this plugin up on a WordPress site, there's, there's two ways to do it, right? One is, once it's connected to the API and everything, whenever you go to publish a post or a page or update a page or a post, 
it can automatically send it to the API for indexing. So even if it's already indexed, but you make a change, when you click the update button, it will automatically send it or ping Google to come recrawl it and re-index it. But what's also cool about it is if you go to the plugin settings on the left, you know, the left sidebar, you click on the um, instant indexer or, or in, uh, in, instant indexing or whatever it's called in the WordPress dashboard. When you click on that and then the settings panel, there's actually a window where you can paste URLs in there and then click submit and it will submit all those URLs to the indexer all at once. So that's something else that you can do is try that. Okay. And I've got, like I said, I've got this installed on multiple sites right now, ever since the search console um, request indexing was disabled. All right. So let me put this on here. And it only takes, I don't know, about, about 10 minutes to set it up. And once you set it up once it's um, you know, you'll be more familiar with it and you can do it on more. You can, by the way, you can use the same API uh, like the same developers um, account for multiple sites. I've mentioned this, somebody else was asking a question about G Suite the other day. For almost every project that I set up, I set up a G Suite account now. So every single uh, project that I have now has uh, its own Google account, its own billing details, you know, it's because it's a G Suite account. So I usually go in and I do a one-to-one -one ratio. So unless like if, it, if it's a brand that has multiple websites, then every website under that brand will, will share the same uh, API. So the same developer's account essentially. But um, if, you know, for everything else, I do a one-to-one -one ratio. So, you know, if, if it's a client, for example, I, I set up G Suite for them, but, you know, they pay for it. And then I go in and set up the, API, the Google indexing API on their account. Uh, if it's projects for me, I do a separate G Suite account for each like lead gen brand, for example, and um, each one of them has their own API, their own billing details and all of that. Okay. So there you go. Try it out. It's good. Well, there's Marco must be watching. <laughs> there's his donation link. So he must be watching. That's kind of interesting, right? BB is up. What's up, BB? Uh, he says, how does Google find pinged? Pages, how does Google find pinged pages to sites? Don't the page somehow need to be discovered? Is there any chance the pinging will never be indexed to some sites? Okay, pinging is a really old, uh, you know, way to get the spiders to come crawl a page. I don't know how valid that still is. I mean, I still do it. Um, like, in other words, here's an example. Let me show you what I mean by that. There are pinging services that you can go to, but let's say... I've got this saved on my desktop or on my, my computer somewhere, but right here. This says 2020, so let's take a look at this. See if they have a text file with this right here. Okay, so guys, just go to search Google search and look for ping list. That's all I did, okay? You can click through. They probably all are very similar. I'm sure they are. This hasn't changed since like, I'm not kidding, since like 2010. Uh, is, and I could probably even look at the date on my... Um, I saved the ping list many years ago to a notepad file and it's, it's probably changed over the years. But what I'm saying is it, it, there's, there's a bunch of these ping services are probably still valid. In fact, let me, um, let me pause the screen for a minute and log into one of my blogs that I can share. And let me show you where you add this because you can copy that ping list guys. I know my screen is paused. Just give me one moment. I'm trying to log in somewhere. But you can copy that ping list and add it to, let's take a look. I think it's under writing. Yes, it is. Okay. So here's a site that I have not added them to. This is my Alpha Land Realty blog, which I don't ever do any blogging on. But if you log into your WordPress site, guys, and you go to settings, writing, okay, you'll see right here where it says update services, ping list right here. So all you do is come over here and you copy all, right? So I'm just going to go through, whoops, looks like there's 56 pinging services in this list. You might be able to find more. It doesn't really matter. Anyways, I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to paste that in right there. Okay. You can expand it. You'll see all the ping lists there and click save changes. Now, every time you update a post, publish a post, publish a page, whatever, it essentially goes out and pings all these ping services. 
and it basically tells them to come crawl, send, send spiders to this page. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know how well that really works anymore. Years ago, that's what you did, but I don't know how well that works anymore. Um, you know, that's why I use indexing services as, as instead of pingers. Uh, so that's what I would recommend that you do. Okay. And I just shared some indexing services that you can use as well as this plugin, which goes directly to the Google indexing API. So this is probably your best bet right here. Okay. So I'm not sure about the other question, part of that question, because I didn't really understand it, BB, but I wouldn't waste my time with pinging stuff other than perhaps on your WordPress site, adding that ping list right there, or one of them that you find from this list here, okay? Okay, new, uh, let's see, that's Adam. So moving on, we're almost done. Hey, look at that. Jason Johnson says, yep, lead simplify. Brad Bradley, regarding a recent Webby you did with Mike Martin on a national site for, say, pest care, would you go with a simple or complex silo? Ooh, that's a really good question. I would still, Jason, I would have to think about that, um, but I would still probably try to go with, not probably, I would go with a simple silo only because a pest control company only has, you know, so many types of services. Maybe they you, you do it by uh, like rodent control, for example. Um, you know, I've got an outdoor pest control company that I've been working with since 2013. So they do mosquito control, tick control, and then uh, they do what's called, um, um, well, they do rodent control, but they, what do they call it? Integrated pest management, uh, perimeter, rod perimeter rodent control, something like that. Anyways, uh, I would still likely go with a simple, comp simple silo because complex silos are complicated. <laughs> Hence the name. They're a bitch. They really are. They're a pain in the ass. It creates a whole bunch. And you know this, Jason, uh, we've talked about this in a mastermind a lot. It creates a lot of issues and it's difficult. You really have to plan out a complex silo site to be done right, especially on a national scale like that. And since I use tags for location silos now, and I've talked about that many times in the mastermind, especially, but also I talk about on a conceptual level, uh, if you go to semanticmastery.com slash process, Guys, I'll put this in a notepad file and blow it up again. We can also put it on the page. Stand by. Uh, let's see, semanticmastery.com slash process, okay? If you go to that, there is training on a conceptual level. Jason, you're in the mastermind. So if you want to go into more detail on this, I'm certainly happy to do that uh, in a mastermind webinar. We can do it. I've got, we've got, my next mastermind webinar is tomorrow. So I can cover it again tomorrow or more in depth tomorrow if you'd like. Um, but there's also on a conceptual level for those of you that are not in the mastermind, which I recommend you join us. But if you don't, you can go to that URL right there. It'll redirect to this process street template or uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. But uh, if you go to website training right there, simple versus complex silos, there's video about that, why I use, you know, uh, why I use simple silos. I prefer that over um uh, complex silos because it's just much easier to manage. Simple silo structures, specifically, I talk about that. Complex silo structures there. I also talk about the difference between physical and virtual silos, uh, which really there's no difference in ranking ability. It's just a difference. It's really a difference in preference. If you want a physical silo shows the silo structure in the URL, a virtual silo has the same silo structure, but it just, it only shows post name in the permalink, right? So it's, you know, domain.com slash postname permalink structure versus category slash postname. Okay. And then if we come down here, I talk about tag silos. I use tag silos for locations. And so what I would suggest for you, Jason, is on a pest, a national pest control company that you set it up with your topical or service-based silos, right? Which would be categories, corresponding pages, and then you can post underneath those but then you set up your location-based silos using tags and you can set up a hierarchy that same way. Like for example, I would do state-based tags as the top uh, location-based tag or location silo tag, right? So it would be like, let's just say, let's just say rodent control is a topical silo. Then I would have rodent control Virginia would be a top level state-based silo location tag. And then I would have perhaps for every single county, right? Let's, I don't know how many counties there are in Virginia, 30 something, I think, or whatever, who knows. Uh, but I would have a, you know, free, like I'm in Culpeper County. So I would have 
you know, rodent control Virginia as, as a tag and in rodent control Culpeper County, for example. And those both of those tags would be added to a post about rodent control in Culpeper, right? And then let's say in the, there's cities inside of Culpeper County, right? So like uh, Jefferson, um, let's just pull something, Elkwood, right? Elkwood is a, is a town in Culpeper. So then I would have that if it was a post about rodent control in Elkwood, Virginia, then that would contain all three tags, right? Rodent control, Virginia, rodent control, Culpeper County, and rodent control, Elkwood. So Elkwood is a town inside of Culpeper County. So there's a hierarchy there. Does that make sense? And I talk about that in this, this is a video, it's 40 minutes long because it's difficult to explain this. Um, so I explain it very thoroughly in this video, but, and I even have a diagram here that kind of shows you what I'm talking about. But if, if you want more kind of in-depth training on that, that's what the mastermind is for. And I've covered it multiple times. You can even go to my webinar archives in the membership site and you can see where I talked about tag, tag location silos or um, tag silos for locations. You can see that right in the lesson header. Uh, so you can go back and watch that. Okay. But to answer your question, I would go with simple silos as much as possible. I don't like to use complex silos anymore at all. Um, and I try to avoid them. BB's question number three. BB, you did good this time, buddy. Look at that. He had one, two up here and then three way down here. So <laughs> BB is coming around. He says, when is the break point of long form content? Uh, meaning which scenarios would we silo and when do we do long form content, which answers and touches on all the subjects on the same topic? Okay, that's a great question uh, for right after what Jason asked. And this is a, it's a great question. Perfect timing, BB. Um, and here's why I like that, because in the past, I would do complex silos because, it, for example, Jason, you know, rodent control, let's say there's, you know, um, mouse, mouse control or mouse extermination or whatever, maybe rats would be different, maybe squirrels would be different, I don't know, is the squirrel really a rodent, I don't know, but whatever, voles or moles, right, those are also different types of rodents. So if you think about a complex silo structure, if you were to do pest control, let's say rodent control would be your top level category, but then you could have subcategories for mouse control, rat control, mole control, right? Let's just, I, I, I don't do all this kind of pest control stuff, but let's say you did that. So you'd have subcategories for each one of them. In that case, I might have a shorter form content on the top level silo page, which would be rodent control, general rodent control. And then I would have separate pages for each one of the sub silos or subcategories that would be the landing pages for specifically mouse control, rat control, mole control, right? And then, so that would be longer form content, but specific about each one of those types of services. Why, well, the way that I do it now, which will answer your question, BB, is I create one long form page about rodent control that covers all of those. Instead of creating subcategories for mouse control, rat control, mole control, I would have headings on that long form content that would cover each one of them. By the way, I like to use a table of contents plugin for long form content so that there's a table of contents that automatically creates jump links to those section headers because those now become additional target, uh, link building targets or content marketing targets that you can get very specific. So instead of having subcategories you can link directly to the section on the long form content page on a simple uh, silo st structure setup. Does that make sense? So I would use long form content with table of contents at the top that will create jump links to the section headers on the page that cover each of the, what would be subcategories if you did a complex silo, I would keep on the one long form content page for uh, rodent control. And then wh where I would, uh, you know, then you can, you can add supporting content as posts and you can link back like, so again, let's say that mole control was the, the last service mentioned on the long form page for on a simple silo structure setup for rodent control. Then let's say for, instead of having a subcategory for mole control, you would, for supporting articles, you would post publish posts about mole control plus city you know, let's say you've got three different cities that you're targeting. So you'd have mole control plus city one, mole control plus city two, whatever those names are. And with the internal link from the post would be the jump link to that section on the page on the long form content on the landing page for rodent control. Does that make sense? So essentially you're still siloing it, but you're doing it in a simple silo structure setup and you're doing it with long form content. 
And that's the way that I do it. Um, so, and again, by the way, you can also, you could even take the content if, if you don't want a 2,500 word article, because that might scare people away, which I don't, I don't care. But you know, uh, uh, if you have like a 25 word article for rodent control, for example, that could be a really long scroll, right? <laughs> but that's why you put a table of contents plugin at the top because it'll jump directly to that section, number one. But number two, you could just put the make the first paragraph visible under each, each section header and then add it to a, the rest of the content for that particular section as like an accordion, right? So you click a plus button or whatever and all of a sudden it expands and shows the rest of the content. That's fine too. As long as the content's visible to the user, even if they have to click a button to see it, it's still there. Does that make sense? So hopefully that makes sense, uh, answer your question. Guys, we're almost out of time. Uh, Scott says, sorry, I didn't realize you would be backtracking to my previous question. I didn't, I didn't know I did, Scott. Did I? I'm sorry if I did. Uh, oh, no, don't worry about it, man. You couldn't have known that. <laughs> you could. So no worries at all. In fact, like I said, I got to show this plugin. I think it's, it's pretty cool. It's free, by the way, guys. Other than, you have to pay um, Google if you... Uh, it's like you get $300 in credits through developers console for free. Like you have to have billing details added, but you get $300 in spend uh, for, I think the first 12 months or something. Um, and then after that, but I mean, unless you're index trying to index like spam links through the indexing index, uh, the indexing plugin, which I would never recommend. Um, then I, I don't think you ever have to, you'll ever reach that limit. Again, don't quote me on that. I don't know what you're doing, but <laughs> But uh, I don't think that's a problem. Okay, I think we're done, guys. I figured simple plus tagging. Jason says, I figured so simple plus tagging. I think that's what I'm going to do. I'll fill you in more than the, I'll fill you in more in the group. Okay, sweet. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for sticking around, guys. We'll see you all next week. Woo. See you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I've got Mastermind webinar tomorrow, guys. So we'll see you there.